Welcome to Eating Cereal. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about epidemiology, and I'll be speaking with a professor of chemical engineering here at the University of Michigan, Dr. Robert Sipp. And tomorrow, I'll be headed west to Jackson, Michigan, where I will be taking on the Dare to be Great Ice Cream Challenge at the Parlor of Jackson. So sit back and enjoy the ride. <laughs> You're watching Eating Cereal. <laughs> All right, this is the Dare to be Great Ice Cream Challenge. 21 scoops, one hour. Let's get it on. Wait, okay. Today's lesson is about epidemics and epidemiology. The definition of an epidemic is a widespread occurrence of an infectious disease at a particular point in time within a community. So some historical examples of diseases that have become epidemics, have been malaria, HIV, Ebola, typhoid fever, and some things that cannot be epidemics are obesity, diabetes, celiac disease, and cancer. Uh, you hear about the obesity epidemic in America in the news all the time. That's not really the right way to say it. Um, it can't be an epidemic because it's not contagious. An epidemic must be contagious. So without further delay, let's get into our discussion with Dr. Zip. So now that we know a little bit about epidemics, let's speak with an expert on the topic. I'm here with Dr. Robert Zip. Dr. Zip got his bachelor's degree in physics from UCLA and his PhD in statistical physics from Rockefeller University. And he is now a professor of chemical engineering here at the University of Michigan. And among his many areas of research is the SIR model st uh, that stands for Susceptible, Infected, Recovered, and it deals with the spread of epidemics. So I guess uh, I'd first like to ask, uh, what, what can you tell us just from a general point of view, what is the SIR model and what does it do? Okay, well, I'll give a little background. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is one of a class of models of epidemics or epidemiology. It goes back almost a hundred years to uh, a paper and a book by Kendrick, it, Kermack and McKendrick, okay. who wrote, who introduced all these different models, the SI model, SIR, and so on and so forth, for modeling populations where you have a certain fraction of people susceptible to a disease, a certain fraction of people infected and infectious, and then a certain fraction of people who are recovered and immune, or they could also be dead. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, so the question is, how does this epidemic spread? So they, these guys, you know, what is it, 90, I guess 90 years old, 90 years ago now, Introduced, looked at all these different models, but they wrote them all in terms of simple, we call them mean field equations, like the time derivative of the number of infected people is proportional, and things like this. Okay. And then solved these equations, and they found if you have different rates of infection and things like this, sometimes the infection died off, and sometimes the infection grew and took over the whole population. So they found like critical behavior depending upon the parameters. So you said 90 years, so it was developed in the, around the 1920s? Yeah. And was there something happening in the world? Was there a specific disease that inspired uh, this model to de develop? Well, that's a good question. I don't really know the answer to that. But I do know at that time, that was when there was a lot of work around the world of, of epidemics, tropical diseases, and so on. In fact, you mentioned I went to Rockefeller University. It was originally the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, and it was founded in the right at the beginning of the 20th century. Okay. And one of their big emphasis was infectious tropical diseases. So I know that there was a lot of interest 
in that time. So in the modern world, what um, can you list off a few specific diseases that this model is applicable for? Well, b b virtually everything that happens. You remember the uh, the um, viruses, the avian flu, and all this stuff from China, for example. Mm -hmm. So people use this way to model it. Is it it's, is it can be used for viruses and bacteria? In fact, anything. In fact, okay. it's also used for forest fires. Oh wow! Okay. <laughs> you know because. A tree burns a neighboring tree, a neighboring tree, and that's, that's a kind of epidemic, too. So let's get into specifically what work you have done in improving this model. Well, the original model was, as I mentioned, just this mean field. We call it mean field. That means uh, you just average out the density of each of the, of the populations. Uh, that was the original model, but then more recently, in the past, you know, 50 years or so, people have been, you know, making computer models of a lot of different things, and people have studied this model on a spatially varied system. And the easiest way to do this is to create a lattice, like a regular square lattice, and in each square there could be different, you know, populations. One way to do it is, is you have one individual, actually do it per site or vertex, one individual per vertex, and that individual can be one of the three states, S, I, or R. Okay. So then it's spatially, and now what happens is, it's not only this whole mean field thing, but there's there could be regions of infected, regions of susceptible, things like this. So it can only... It can only fall into one of those three categories, S, I, or R. Is in this model, you can okay. make other models where there are. Where others. there's like immune. Right. Immune. Okay. Yes, yes. I see. Right. Okay, and I guess um, lattice, can you sort of explain physically what is a lattice? I guess. I, I, um, well, it can be something literally, like I mentioned the forest fire. The trees are on a regular square array. Yeah. And then they're just a perfect square relation. Them. So we call that a lattice, square lattice, or it's like a, a grid. A or, grid, you okay. can call it a grid. But you can make up all kind of lattices, triangular lattice, honeycomb lattice, all kind of things like this. But this is a very uh, common thing in statistical physics that even systems that are not naturally on a lattice, we model them on a lattice because that makes it a lot easier. So what was the alternative uh, before? You said mean mean field. Yeah. Mean field. I guess. Can you explain the difference between uh, between yeah. those two? Well, the word mean field. I don't know if you remember this in your thermodynamics, <laughs> but there was the famous Van der Waals equation. I know the Van der Waals equation of state. Okay. And this is the first place the mean field came in. He's trying to figure out. You have all of the other molecules around something, and they have an interaction between all of them. And it's a very complicated thing to figure out what is the interaction. But Van der Waals says the net interaction is just proportional to the, actually, the density of all of the neighbors around it, the density of other sites. It's like instead of a specific field like intermolecular potential, mm -hmm. we average it. It's called the mean field. Okay. So you like you average over all of that. So nowadays, we anything that involves averaging over the whole system we call mean field. Yeah. And then it simplifies the, the problem to just, we have them right here, not you could read it, but uh, just some diff, some three differential equations to find the mean field of, of this particular model. What are, what are the biggest goals uh, in terms of uh, social impact, uh, just the world in general? What, what are the big goals of this, of this line of research? Well, the, the basic goal was to understand at what rate of infection a disease will grow or not grow. Okay. That was the original one. Now, I'm sh I've done some work here, and maybe I could scroll it down, where you can look at on these regular lattices, and you get like, like um, here's a little spot right here. The disease starts right there and spreads throughout the neighbors like this. Now, this is at the, there's one parameter in this model that's 
like the rate of infection of the neighbors compared to the rate of recovery. Okay. So it just has one parameter, the ratio of those two rates. And there's a critical value of those parameters. There's, there's a critical point where the, where the epidemic just spreads. It, okay, so if it's above this parameter, the epidemic will spread. If it's below this, or if it's below this specific, yeah. specific, specific value, it will be contained. Right. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And when you're exactly at that threshold, it, it spreads, you know, most of the time. It grows pretty big, but eventually it always dies out, although the mean size of the epidemic is infinite. But as you can see in this picture here, it grows in a not just like we call it compact, where it doesn't just grow out like a traveling in, in like circle that gets bigger and bigger, but it grows, it's called a fractal. It grows as a fractal. Yeah, okay. Exactly at the critical point. Under this model, if a person is infected, is that just a yes or no parameter, or is there a scalar? Can there be a level well, of infection that can be applied? You can make models anyway, but this particular one is yes, no. Yes, no, okay. Yeah. I guess, current, what's the latest with your research on this yeah. SIR model then? Well, right now I'm, I'm studying not exactly the SIR, but I'm studying this percolation model, which is the SIR model at the critical point, and studying these kind of clusters here, and studying the holes in the cluster, and the size of the holes in the cluster. And incredibly, we find some certain properties of the system that, here's another topic, that follows ZIPS law, not ZIPS law, Z-I-P-F, ZIPS law. ZIPS law goes back to studying uh, uh, occurrence of words in a language, like the most frequent word, the second most frequent, third most frequent. And ZIPS law is that the frequency um, is inversely proportional to the rank. Rank is like per second, third, fourth. Yes. Okay. And it turns out every language in the world follows the same law. Okay. That the frequencies versus well, the properties of the holes of the percolation cluster also follow Zipf's law, where the rank, like the largest, second largest, third largest, is inversely proportional to the size. So, if you look in the description, I have posted some links to Dr. Zipf's work as well as many of the topics that have been discussed. And Dr. Ziff, I want to thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, and nice seeing you again. Good, Good to see you, sir. Here. So, uh, let's see what's next. Okay. It's not gonna happen. No, it's not gonna happen. Damn. Man. <sighs> Too much ice cream. Well, I did not finish the ice cream, unfortunately, but I did learn a lot from my discussion with Dr. Ziff. I hope you did as well. And I hope it sparked your interest in a lot of different fields of math and science. And uh, in the description below, I'll post as many links as I can to different research in these areas. So I hope you'll check them out and see if you can learn some more. And that will do it for this lesson. Thank you for tuning in, and let's talk about churn rate. Churn rate, but it has nothing to do with butter. Next time on Eating Cereal.